Hello everyone, welcome to lecture three of the course Philosophy of Science for Psychologists. We'll start today by looking at the synthesis that Immanuel Kant made of rationalism and empiricism, and we'll see whether that works to refute the skeptic. After that, we'll take a look at two other developments in the history of thinking about knowledge and science. We look at positivism, which basically says that in the social sciences, you should use the same scientific method as in the natural sciences. And hermeneutics is a response to that and says that the social sciences have their own scientific method. We'll end, as usual, with a summary and a preview. So we saw last time that rationalism and empiricism both were unable to justify knowledge. And now we'll look at Immanuel Kant who argues that if you make a synthesis, a combination of rationalism and empiricism, then you can justify knowledge, and you can have justified the true beliefs. Kent started as an astronomer. So he was very much influenced by Newton and his discoveries and the success of physics. But then he reads David Hume. So Immanuel Kant was interested in knowledge about the world. He was optimistic, just as uh, we saw last time that uh, other scientists and philosophers were. He was optimistic about the idea of actually being able to acquire knowledge about the world. And the success of the physical sciences, of course, was an indication, or at least that is what people are inclined to think, that, well, what you have discovered are actually discoveries of facts. But then there's David Hume, who says, well, if you think about facts, you think about in terms of cause and effect, and that is indeed the case in Newtonian laws. Kant would uh, agree with that. And then the problem is, if you observe, if you, you, if you gain knowledge by observing the world or observing the results of your experiments, if you have an empiricist view on empirical science, then you cannot justify your beliefs that contain this notion of causality because you can't justify this concept of causality. You can't have knowledge about causal relations. So that's what we looked at last time. I can't read that and says, I freely admit that the remembrance of David Hume was the very thing that many years ago first interrupted my dogmatic slumber. So he was asleep in his dogmatic sleep. He was thinking that he could get knowledge about the facts by using the scientific method, by using observation and experiments. And he gave me a completely different direction to my researches in the field of speculative philosophy. So he had to change his thought about philosophy and uh, how to justify beliefs. So what did Kant think before he read Hume? Well, he thought he really, really knew that Newton's laws were correct, that it's that we had knowledge, that Newton had found knowledge about the world, had discovered something about the world was actually true, and then we could uh, say that it's true. And then he read Hume, and he says, well, we can never be sure about any law because all laws contain, all natural laws contain this notion of causality, and we cannot have knowledge about causal relations. We cannot have knowledge about causality. I can then conclude that there indeed is a problem, and he tried to save knowledge of the Newtonian law. So he, he is a scientist that says, yes, David Hume, you're right. But also, yes, 
Isaac Newton you're right. And it looks like they can't both be right at the same time. So what does he do? Well, he agrees up to a certain point with Hume and then says, and here is where you go wrong. So he agrees with Hume that you say, and that's a claim he makes, that's an example he gives, all candles melt in the sun. Well, if you say that, if you think that that's a true statement, then if you are an empiricist, you can't have knowledge about causality. And I hope you see where this is going. If you are an empiricist, you can't have knowledge about causality. And then you ca cannot make general claims that contain the notion of causality, even if it's implicit, like, like here, all candles melt in the sun, means the sun has the causal power to uh, melt candles, right? So there is causality involved there. It is due to the fact that uh, the heat of the sun uh, influence the wax of the candles causally that the uh, candles melt. So he says we cannot use our senses, only our senses, to determine that the sentence is true. But he also disagrees with Q because he says if we make a combination of empiricism, which you, David Hume, have shown that is wrong, and rationalism, which John Locke had shown that is wrong, if we make a combination, a synthesis, then maybe we, we are able to show that Newtonian laws are knowledge, or our knowledge about the Newtonian laws indeed is knowledge, that the laws are true, and that indeed all candles melt in the sun, that that claim is true. Kant thus is not a rationalist and he's not an empiricist. He tries to make a synthesis of these two views on knowledge in the hope that in this combination, in the synthesis, we can find a justification for general laws and thereby we can save knowledge from the skeptic. How does he do that? Well, this is a fairly complicated epistemology. What we do need is several concepts, several pairs of concepts. So I'll explain those first, and then we'll see how he uses these concepts in order to show what he needs to argue for, to save knowledge, to make knowledge possible, to justify knowledge within this epistemology in which rationalism and empiricism are combined. So that's what we do first. So let's look at what we need. So what are the tools, the conceptual tools we need to defend the claim that the synthesis of rationalism and empiricism enables us to justify our beliefs so that we actually can say we have knowledge, particularly knowledge about physical laws. So we need two pairs of concepts, Kant says, a priori and a posteriori, those two concepts we need, and the concepts analytic and synthetic, and they all apply to judgments. So you have a priori judgments, a posteriori judgments, analytic judgments and synthetic judgments. And a judgment is just a statement, a claim. So that's the, the, the terminology here. So we have an a priori judgment, for instance. So what is an a priori statement? What is an a priori claim? Well, that's a claim of which you can establish the truth or falsehood without looking at the world. So you can close your eyes and then you can establish whether a certain statement, a certain judgment is true. So if you know what a man is, and if you know what a brother is, and if you know what A is and what is is, then you can say the sentence, the judgment, a brother is a man, is that true? Yes, you can establish the truth of that a priori without looking at the world. You don't have to go and research all the brothers and see whether they are man. 
because a brother is a man. You know that it's a, it's like definition. So it's the truth is known without doing research, without looking at the world, without doing any investigation. It's true based on concept on the concepts you use. Now, of course, then you say, then you see what an a posteriori judgment is. Again, it's a statement, a claim, a judgment of which you want to establish the truth. And you can't do that with your eyes closed. You have to do some research. You have to look at the world. So an a priori judgment is a judgment of which you have to establish the truth or falsehood by doing some investigation in the world. You have to look. Well, we're not in a classroom now, but usually this would be my uh, one of my examples. There were 199 students in this classroom. Well, if you're in a classroom, uh, you can close your eyes, but that won't help you. You have to open your eyes and count them. And then you say, well, I've done a little, re little research and actually it is true or, well, unfortunately, it's false. Whatever. You have to do some research to establish whether the claim is true or not. So that's for the first uh, pair of concepts. Let's look at the second pair of concepts, analytic and synthetic. They both also apply to judgments. So you have analytic judgments. Those are judgments that do not provide you with new knowledge. So you analyze what you already know. So uh, Ken's example, for instance, is if you know what a body is, and a body is just a physical object, so that's the terminology he uses, a body, a physical object, if you don't say a body has extension, of, or all bodies have extension, so extension meaning having three dimensions, then you say, yeah, yeah, I knew that. Any physical object does have a place in space, has three dimensions. That's basically what is what what what, what, what uh, this claim is. All physical objects have three dimensions. Is that something new? Is that something you learned? No, but I might not have ever put it on paper like that. Have thought about that, but it's not new knowledge. It's analyzing. Uh, it's specifying the details, maybe. Uh, but the details were already known. So it's specifying what you already know, it's analyzing what you already know. Hence, <clears throat> it's an analytic judgment. And that means that it doesn't provide you with new knowledge. And if we're thinking about epistemology, and we're thinking about what the source of knowledge is, where knowledge comes from, then of course, you want to have a source of knowledge. And that means that there's knowledge coming from, it's new. So you want to learn something new. If you say, I'm a good scientist, uh, I analyze all the concepts I already have. And you say, well, well, what about discovering something new? If you're, say, if you're thinking about the, the, the Corona crisis, you're looking for a vaccine. Uh, well, I can say, well, I'm just going to think about what I already know and analyze all these concepts. Well, that won't help. So it might be a useful tool, to analyze what you already know and make it maybe more specific and explicit and write things down. But in the end, we are interested in another type of judgment, a type of judgment, a type of claim that is new, that provides us with new knowledge. And those are the synthetic judgments. So if you say, if you have a physical object and then you say, this is heavy, and then you're telling someone something they didn't know. Ah, okay, okay, then you have new knowledge. So that's a synthetic judgment, a judgment that provides you with new knowledge. And Kant uses these two pairs of concepts, a priori and a posteriori, and analytic and synthetic, to develop an epistemology in which we can have knowledge, and we can justify our claims, our judgments, about causal relations in the world. So in order to do that, we need to combine these two concepts. And now we will see how Kant is making a combination of rationalism and empiricism. Because we have judgments, claims, statements that can be 
either analytic or synthetic and can be either a priori and a posteriori. So we can make, we, we can have four combinations and we have to take a look at that. And then you'll see that Kant is indeed making a synthesis and that he differs from uh, rationalists and empiricists. If you look at analytic statements, there can be a priori. That is, an analytic statement is a statement that analyzes what you already know, it specifies what you already know, and then you can have analytic judgments that are also a priori judgments. All bodies have extensions, all physical objects have three dimensions. Is that something you already knew? Yeah, that's not new knowledge, so it's an analytic statement that analyzes and specifies what you already know, specifies what you already know. And is this true? Well, yeah, it's true. I know this already, so it has to be true. And then I close my eyes and I think, is this true? Yes, it's true. Okay, so that means that it's an a priori judgment. So these exist. Analytic statements are a priori statements because if you have an analytic statement and it's a statement in which you analyze what you already know, then to establish that it's true, you don't have to do any research. So an analytic statement that's also a posteriori, that's nonsense. Because that would be a statement of which you know it's true, but to establish the truth, <laughs> you have to do some research in the real world. Well, no, well, then you didn't know it. Then it was not an analytic statement. Okay, so all philosophers, all scientists agree, analytic statements do, uh, analytic statements that are also a posteriori statements do not exist. That means that all analytic statements are a priori statements. The problem and the difference in views is with the synthetic judgment, the synthetic statements. Because synthetic statements give you new knowledge. They tell you things you didn't know. So suppose you learn how to calculate, how to add stuff, how to add numbers. So, and you know what adding is, so you know what a plus is, you already know what the is is, what is equal is, and you already know the concept of five and the concept of, se of seven. So if you know the concept of five, as a child, you learn how to calculate, you know what five is, you know what seven is, you know what adding is, you know where you learn two plus two equals four, you learn that, so you know what equals means and you know how to add, then you can come up with new knowledge, that is, you can find out a priori without looking at the world, so with, with closing your eyes you can find out that 5 plus 7 equals 12, and that's new knowledge, so it's synthetic, it's synthetic and a priori, it's synthetic, you acquire new knowledge by using only your ratio, well clearly and this is the example that Kant gave, that is a rationalistic element in his epistemology. And here you see that he differs from the empiricists. An empiricist would say, well, all knowledge stems from experience using my senses. So all knowledge, all new knowledge, all synthetic judgments, come from doing research in the world, and those are a priori judgments. So an empiricist would say a synthetic judgment a priori doesn't exist. There is no new knowledge to be found by using only your ratio. So that is something an empiricist would deny. So 5 plus 7 equals 12 either it has to be a synthetic judgment a posteriori or it has to be an, an analytic judgment a priori. So we'll not debate that, but that's what an empiricist would say. And an empiricist, of course, would agree with Kant that something like, this is a yellow book, if you have a book and you say, well, oh, if someone asks what color is it? Well, uh, let's see, oh, it's yellow. So then that's something new, that's a judgment providing you with new knowledge and to know whether it's true, you have to do some research. Is it yellow? Uh, yes, it's yellow. Okay, how, much, how many pages does it have? Uh, 529, okay, so uh, that is synthetic, it's new knowledge, and you establish whether that's true or not by looking at the world. So that is where Kant, of course, has an empiricist element in his 
the philosophy of knowledge in his epistemology. So quick side note for the exam, make sure that you know the concepts here, that you know what analytic means, what synthetic means, that you know what a priori and a posteriori means, that you can apply them to judgments, that you have examples of them. Stick to the examples we discussed. So all bodies have extension. That is an example that Kant gave. Um, five plus seven is 12. That's an example that Kant gave. So don't come up with new examples. You are allowed to do so. It's a no, uh, I don't uh, say you're not allowed to, but better safe than sorry, just use the examples we used in the lectures and in the book and in the tutorials. Just use those, then you're, uh, you're sure that uh, you're right with examples. Because on an open question, I might ask you, provide an example uh, well, to, to illustrate something or to explain something. So, and make also sure that you understand the difference between an empiricist, for instance, and uh, Kant who makes a synthesis. How do uh, empiricists like David Hume and later the logical positivists, we'll look at them in one of the next lectures, how do they think about synthetic judgments a priori? That are also a priori judgments. How do they think about that? Make sure you understand that. Because I have, for instance, here, I have four options. Analytic a priori, analytic a posteriori, synthetic a priori, and synthetic a posteriori. So that means that if I have to make a multiple choice question, this is an easy way of doing it. Is 5 plus 7 uh, equals 12? Uh, what kind of uh, judgment according to Kant? Or according to Hume or according to the logical positivist is 5 plus 7 equals 12 and then I give the four options make sure you understand this and so you also understand what Hume would say what the logical positivist would say okay let's continue the lecture what is it that Kant wants to show using these two pairs of concepts he wants to show that synthetic knowledge a priori is possible, especially that we can have synthetic knowledge a priori, synthetic judgments that are also a priori judgments about the world being causally structured. So he's trying to show that he can have synthetic knowledge about laws but physical laws newton has discovered these laws so these were new when this newton discovered them so it was synthetic and Kant tries to show that we can establish a priori that they have to be true you can establish the truth of those laws a priori so why does he do that let's take stock let's let's take a step back so he, he basically is interested in making a claim like everything in nature has a cause and that's quite human quite in line with Hume because Hume says if we think about the matters of facts we do that in terms of cause and effect every event in the world is an effect of a prior cause and might be the cause of a new effect so I think everything in nature has a cause is something that Hume would agree with Hume tried to defend that in a certain sense, and he failed. So, when Newton discovered the laws, or when you discover this, this law, this more, more general law, that everything in nature has a cause, that's a synthetic judgment. It's something you have discovered about the world. So it's synthetic, it provides you with new knowledge. And now we I hope you see what, what he is doing because Hume was an empiricist. Hume tried to show that this synthetic knowledge was an a posteriori judgment. So you own if, if you're an empiricist, you can only have synthetic judgments that are a posteriori, not a priori. And if you see that, then you see that there are two ways 
of trying to justify a claim like this, everything in nature has a cause, a judgment like this, a synthetic judgment like this, there are two ways of doing that, a posteriori, that's what Hume tried to do and that failed, then there's just one other option, you have to show that this is an a priori synthetic judgment, and that's what Kant is trying to do. So, here you also see that making this conceptual analysis is really important of seeing what, uh, how, you, how you might solve a problem. Here you say, okay, so if we make this distinction between a priori, a posteriori, synthetic and analytic, then we can make these four types of judgment. Well, one doesn't exist, but three seem to exist. There is, and, and there is a uh, debate about whether there are synthetic judgments that are also a priori. Kant says, yes, they are, there are, and it is it's precisely these, these claims we need to have knowledge about the world at all, which makes it possible for us to have knowledge about the world at all, that are synthetic judgments a priori. And that is what he's trying to show. Well, we'll see how he does that. How does Kant proceed? Well, in order to see that, we need again a pair of concepts, two concepts that belong together, that Kant then uses to argue in favor of his epistemology. Remember, he tries to defend the claim that you can have knowledge about causality, and that has to be synthetic and a priori. Now, he makes a distinction between the noumenal world and the phenomenal world. The phenomenal world is the world as it appears to us. We have seen phenomenology, the way we experience things in the philosophy of mind course. So this is very similar. He says there is the, the way the world presents itself to us. It appears to us. That's the phenomenal world. And there is the noumenal world, the, the, the world behind the appearances. And what can we know? Well, we cannot have knowledge about the noumenal world, the world in itself, the world of itself. So where the things are the way they are, and we have no, we have no access to that. Because what we do is we experience the world in a certain way, and that is the phenomenal world, the world as it appears to us, and there we can have knowledge about. I can have knowledge about the way I experience this uh, this slide, I might not have knowledge about the slide, the slide itself in itself in a noumenal world, but I can have knowledge the way I experience it, the way I perceive it. So we have this doubling of the world, and note this is not the same as Plato. So this is the noumenal world is not the world of ideas, for instance. So that's, there, in both cases there are two worlds, but they're not the same two worlds. So it's different. So be sure to make this distinction on your exam. What Kant tries to do is he tries to explain what the conditions are that allow us to have knowledge. And of course, that is knowledge of the phenomenal world, because there is no knowledge possible of the noumenal world the world behind the phenomena. And as this is called transcendental philosophy, and transcendental means that it pertains to the conditions of the possibility of uh, knowledge, what we are interested in. Now, what is relevant, and here we see that Kant makes this synthesis, actually it makes this a synthesis of empiricism and rationalism, because he says what we need in order to be able to have knowledge about the phenomenal world is the forms of sensations and the categories of reason. So the sensation, that's the empiricist part, and the categories of reason, that's clearly the rationalist part. And you need them both, so it actually is a synthesis. It's not that you can have one or the other and then have knowledge. You, you need to have both in order to be able to have knowledge. So it's about 
the conditions we uh, that need to be satisfied in order to be able to have knowledge. So there are the forms of sensation, and these forms are just two: the space and time. Everything we perceive, everything that enters our sensory system, enters the system in space and time. But if you have all the input coming in your system only in space and time, it's basically chaos. You have chaotic input. So you need to categorize, to classify this input. And then you have to have categories, and these categories belong to reason, belong to your ratio. So that takes us to the categories of reasons. So there's input coming in time and space, and then this input needs to be categorized. And one of these categories, for instance, is substance. So then you put it into this box, and then you can have knowledge about the phenomenal world, the way it appears to us. So you, you put sensations into boxes, into categories. Well, I'm not going to ask this on the exam. That goes way too far. You basically need to know that this happens, that he says, well, there's input coming in for you via your, your senses, and then it scales, and that needs to be classified, and that you, then you need your reason. So you put all the input in boxes, and then you have an experience of a house or a, a snowball or whatever. And then he's, he has uh, four groups of categories and all kinds of subgroups. And what is interesting is this one. Ken says, one of the categories of reason is the category of relation, and that is, in this case, uh, causality. And that, of course, is what we're interested in right now, given the fact that we're interested in justifying claims made by, for instance, Newton about ca causal laws that apply in the world, that describe the world. So, just you, you need to know that uh, it works in this way, and that causality is one of the subcategory. So objects always have a certain shape, right? So they always appear in space to us. If you have a physical object, it has three dimensions. It has always a place in space. It always appears in space to us. And it always lasts some time. So if you have a, a snowball, it will melt. It will disappear. So it appears to us also in time for a certain duration. And in this case, you can say, well, it's a physical substance. It's a thing. Uh, so you classify it as a substance, and maybe you have all other categories you use to classify it, and then you can have knowledge about the snowball and how it appears to us. You cannot have knowledge about the snowball in itself, in the noumenal world. You can't have that. You can only have knowledge about how it appears to us. And then, it, then one of the things is that everything also appears to us as causes and events. And that is because we classify the events we perceive with our reason. So clearly, this is a synthesis. You can't, if, if you have only the input, you only have chaos. You need more than the input of your senses, you need the categories of reason. If you have the categories, only have the categories of reason, you have basically empty boxes. You need to have something to put in that, and then you can have knowledge. So you need both sensory input and the categories of your reason, of your ratio. And what now happens, and uh, Kant is not really modest here, he says, what happens thus, is that there is a change in thinking about the world and how we perceive the world, how we get knowledge of the world. Because usually we think there is a world out there, objective, independent of us. And we have all kinds of senses and a brain, and so we have a mind, a ratio, and whether, you, whether you're an empiricist or a rationalist, you try to gain objective knowledge about the objective existing world. So, and if you have knowledge, if you say my belief is a justified or true belief, it represents the facts of the objective world, the way the objective world is, 
then you say, well, the sentence is true. And what happens then is that the world puts structure onto us. The world is structured in a certain way, and we discover it. And if we discover it, then we say we have knowledge. Kant turns this around, and he calls that the Copernican turn in philosophy. Because the, the real Copernican turn was, of course, that Copernicus puts uh, not the, uh, the earth in the center of the universe, but the sun. And then, wow, in astronomy, that was a really huge change. Because then you have to think in a, in a new way about Earth. Apparently, Earth is not the center of the universe. That has also implications of, uh, for how we think about human beings, etc. So that really was a turn in science. Ken now says, I'm like the Copernicus of epistemology, of philosophy. Not, I'm not claiming that the world puts a structure upon us, but we make the structure, we put the structure onto the world. We impose with our categories structure on the world. That's turning it around. It's like putting the sun in the center of the universe while all along we thought that the earth was in the center of the universe. So all along we've been thinking that the world imposes structure, its structure upon us when we know it, and Kant turns it around and says, no, no, we put structure onto the phenomenal world. And then we can have knowledge because then we put our, our category, we use that category of causality and we use that to put to impose structure on the phenomenal world and then you can have knowledge about the causal relations in the phenomenal world and that according to kent is a priori this is not something you have established by doing research this is about a transcendental philosophy this is about thinking and therefore it's a priori it's about thinking about the conditions that have to apply for us in order to be able to have knowledge about the world. So now do a thought experiment. So try to imagine something that does not appear in time and space to us. If you then say, well, I, I can't imagine anything not appearing in time and space to us, then that becomes a reason to believe that indeed everything that appears to us via our senses that comes as input is in time and space so that is the way the world presents it to us but then it would still be uh, chaos so then you can ask the question what may appear as something that does not belong to a category of something well, yeah everything appears as belonging to a category of something so that also is a condition that applies if we have knowledge about the world it has to. So that's the idea. It has to. It's necessary. One of the categories is causality. So it cannot be otherwise, according to Kant, that things appear to us as causes and effects. So here he is very close to David Hume, right? David Hume says, if we think about the world, it's always in, in terms of cause and effect. If we think about the, the, the matters of fact in terms of causality, David Hume says. Kant says, yeah, that's correct, but you have shown that if you try to justify this a posteriori, that that will fail. And here is my a priori justification for that. And now I can actually claim that I can have knowledge about causal relations and I can have knowledge about general laws in which causality uh, figures, in which causality is uh, an implicit or explicit part. So this is a priori and it's synthetic. So this is what Kant was out to uh, demonstrate. One big problem for the Kantian epistemology is that Kant start off, starts off with claiming that there is a noumenal world and a phenomenal world and that we cannot have knowledge about the noumenal world, but that the things in themselves, so the things in the noumenal world, influence, determine our sensations. But if you can't say anything, if you can't have knowledge about the noumenal world, how can you say that? 
that there are things in themselves that influence our um, sensations. Furthermore, isn't that just saying that they cause our sensations? But causality is a concept that we, as a category, that we apply ourselves to the phenomenal world. It's part of the phenomenal world, not of the um, uh, noumenal world. At least you can't know that. So he runs into trouble making this distinction and making claims about things he says he cannot know things about. And he makes knowledge claims about them. So that's a problem. That, is, that makes it an unrealistic theory, a theory that has an obvious flaw. Uh, the other thing is that if you say that we can have synthetic a priori judgments so that we can acquire knowledge that's synthetic, it's new, we can acquire it, and it's a priori, we can establish the truth without looking at the world, without doing any research, then they cannot turn out to be false. If you say, well, I do not have to do any research to establish that this claim is true, And it can't be the case that later it turns out that Newtonian laws or uh, things like that, that you can say that are uh, a priori true, or that has to be true, but they turn out to be, to be false. When we discuss proper in two uh, lectures, we'll see that clearly uh, the Newtonian laws were not saved by um, this Kantian synthesis. And it also shows that he is just plain wrong. Now, I think the most problematic issue with Kantian philosophy is that he basically says, well, the skeptic is right. That is, he doesn't say it like that. He tries to save knowledge from the skeptic. He tries to come up with a justification for our beliefs. So he believes that we can have real knowledge. This knowledge pertains to the phenomenal world. But the skeptic would say, well, I'm not interested in how the world appears to me, how things appear to me, I want to know what the world is like, how, what effects are about the normal world, about the real world. So Kant sets the bar very low. He says, well, the only thing I want to know, or I claim to have knowledge about, is the way they, the things appear to me. And then apparently because it's a transcendental philosophy it has to appear to you in the same the same way but how can you know so he puts the bar very low and the skeptic basically has can say well you start off by saying there is a noumenal world and a phenomenal world and we can't have knowledge about the noumenal world well basically that's skepticism that's what i'm claiming all along so Kantian, the Kantian synthesis doesn't work if it's intended to show that a skeptic is wrong. And basically that was what he tried to do, right? Because it's a response to Hume, to the empiricist Hume, that in all honesty has to conclude that skepticism is right. Now Kant is trying to show that if you try to defend these Newtonian laws, for instance, by trying to show that they are synthetic and a posteriori, as Hume tried to do, that indeed is doomed to fail. So if these laws are synthetic, they are judgments and they are new, they provide us with new knowledge, and, you, and they are true, then we have to establish that they are true a priori. Well, yeah, and then you can say, well, it appears to me and it's necessary that it appears to me, but that's not very convincing because that's just making claims about how things appear to you and not how things are in the real world, the world behind how everything appears. And then he says, well, is this my Copernican, Copernican turn? Yeah, you can make that claim, being not that very modest, but then you say, I make... Um, I put the structure, I impose structure on the world, but uh, that's not very convincing 
if you want to know what the world is like, you might also make a claim that the world is pro providing you with inputs. Well, so apparently there is a there is a world that's structured in a certain certain way, in such a way that it provides you with input. I want to know how that world is. That's what a skeptic says. And you say, in my account, you can't know that. Well, that's what I've been claiming all along. So it's not a very good refutation of, not a very good rebuttal of the skeptic and uh, their arguments. So we're still debating the skeptic. Plato, Aristotle, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, Descartes, and now Kant, they didn't succeed in refuting the arguments of the skeptic. They did not succeed in showing that we can justify our beliefs. But I think it's understandable that they try to do that and they try to do that for the scientific judgments. So the statements made by natural science, like Newtonian science, right? So in, in, in the end, so when we're talking about Hume and Kant, they uh, were of course very impressed with their contemporary science. These sciences were really successful. So you have this intuition that, well, they're probably right. We'll get back to that in later lectures, but we can understand why they try to justify the claims made by uh, the sciences in their time, in their times. And those were the natural sciences, right? So there were no social sciences back then. So they're trying to figure out nature and it really worked. So then the question is, okay, so if we are able to find the things out about the natural world, would then this method also not be very convenient to solve things in the social world, to find out how social the social world works and then try to make the world a little bit better. So that's that's one thing. Uh, that is basically if you see social problems and you see a method that solves problems uh, about the natural world, then you might say, well, maybe we should use that method to solve these problems as well. And then once you've done that, you have uh, the start of social sciences. Then you can ask, of course, well, we use this method of the natural sciences to uh, social issues, to, we apply it to social issues. So we have a method for the natural sciences and we use that also for within the social sciences, but maybe the social sciences need a method of their own. Now, positivists defend the first view and hermeneutics defend the second. And we'll take a look at that now. Basically, rationalism, empiricism, and also the Kantian synthesis fail to come up with a solution to how to justify true beliefs. So it seems that knowledge is impossible. But we've also seen that science in those days flourished. So even though you might not have a justification for your beliefs, people still believe that their beliefs are true and then you can come up with the idea and people came up with the idea that you might use the successful method in the natural sciences to solve social problems to solve political problems and that is what argues Kant did with his positivism positivism is a term that was coined by August Comte and he tried to solve social problems in French society. He lived uh, in the times after uh, the uh, French Revolution. So there was a famine in France prior to um, the French Revolution. Then there was a French Revolution and the idea was of course that it would improve society, that it would uh, end poverty maybe even. And what Comte saw after the revolution was that there was still poverty, people not having enough to eat, and also he saw that there were really, really, really rich people. So it didn't really work in his eyes. So that means 
that there are social problems and there is politics and politics apparently is unable to solve these social problems and we, we are apparently or back then and I think it still applies apparently it didn't work in French society to use politics to come to consensus about how to solve social problems in their society. And then Kohn says, okay, we need to have a method that enables us to get to consensus about how to solve social problems. Since there is no method in politics that can do that, we have to look somewhere else. And of course, he looks at the natural sciences or the sciences back then, because there were no other sciences. So there is, there are the natural sciences. There's this method in which, the, 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 if you use that method, so you get to consensus. People are in agreement that the, new, the laws of Newton work, for instance. And then you say, well, if you want to know the social world and you want to solve the problems in the social world, why not apply that method? And then, of course, you get to the foundation of sociology. This is where uh, it starts. How do we do that? And Com says, well, we have to establish the principles of positive thinking. Com says, I have discovered the law, a law of three stadia. So there's Com's law of the three stadia. And he says, every society, and there's the science in those societies, or the way to gain knowledge in those societies, that always, always goes through three stages, the theological stage or the fictional stage, and then you go to the metaphysical or abstract stage, and then to the positive, the real or scientific stage. So let's start with the first one. So initially a society and also thus the ways the society answers questions, tries to gain knowledge, is characterized by belief in supernatural beings and forces. So basically in gods. Hence the theological states, stage. And of course, there is distinction in between that. You have animism, you have polytheism, you have multiple gods, and then you go to monotheism. So that's a little improvement. You go from, from many gods to one god. And what you do is you try to explain things in the world. For instance, how come that some things are alive and some not, some not? Well, uh, there was a god and uh, he blew his breath into this animal or this, this person and that made this person alive. So that is a theological explanation of life. And of course, you don't find them in our biology books. The second stage is the metaphysical stage. So you do away with God, but you still have abstract powers, abstract principles that you use to explain stuff, essences. For example, in this case, if we again look at life, life is explained by the fact there is a life force in us, a long vital, a life-giving principle. So basically that's not an explanation, that is saying, well, you have something that's alive here, and well, there is a life-giving thing in it. Yeah, but that doesn't explain it. It's just saying it's alive. And you postulate that there's a life-giving thing in it, but it doesn't give you any insight because then you need to know, of course, what this life force is. So that's really abstract. That's a metaphysical stage. And then you go in the end to the positive, the positivist stage, the scientific stage, and that's the stage that is characterized by providing explanations in terms of cause and effect. We have seen it in Hume, we have seen that in Kant, we've seen it here again, and 
okay, we have to observe reality, we have to do maybe experiments and find out what the way, what, what the, way of the world is, what the facts are. And then you say, well, what is life? Well, life is the capacity for digesting food, for instance, metabolism, reproduction, and you try to find out what the mechanisms are, for instance, behind digesting food. How does that work? And once you've done that, you have a scientific explanation, a mechanistic explanation. So it's very much in line with Cartesian and Newtonian uh, theories. And that is the end. And then you have a society that accepts science. Let's look at a contemporary example, because I think this is still somewhat the case. So if we take a look at the Netherlands, then what you want, of course, is the best policies. So our government provides all the political parties with money to have their own scientific bureaus, the scientific research institutes, that basically have to check the scientific status of their political program. And the idea, of course, is that, well, that would help to establish consensus and that politicians look at scientists to solve problems. And you should do that. So this is part of character building, you could say. If you become a politician, please listen to the scientists, because the scientists are in the business of finding out what the facts are and what you should do to change society, to change a person, uh, whatever you uh, are trying to change for the good. So in, in, in a contemporary case, of course, listen to the scientists when uh, you want to solve the corona crisis. That's the only way to go. And don't try to politicize the scientists. Don't have the scientists say things that is in line with your political ideas or freedom or something. No, just let the scientists do their work. Give them the money, give them the research institute, give them everything they need, and don't bother them anymore and just listen to them. Uh, but clearly, people don't do that. Clearly, the scientists involved in the corona crisis, uh, at, at least in uh, the ones that uh, tell the government about them, they don't always listen uh, to uh, the scientists are influenced by the politicians. Let's, let's, let's keep it at that. So that should not be the case, of course. So there is a character essence to be learned here. Don't have politics influence science, but have science influence politics. And then we might get to consensus in politics of what to do. But why do you need parties then anymore? Because whether you're on the left or the right or in the middle, science is the science and it tells us what to do. And well, we don't really need to vote about that, right? So there is this idea of positivism uh, solving, of positivism, that science can solve social problems as well. And of course, we have all these political parties with all their scientific research institutes and they all tell something different. So clearly uh, something's wrong here. How is this relevant to psychology? Well, in psychology, you also don't find these metaphysical principles or God anymore uh, in, uh, in uh, your psychology book. You, you don't have the, the psychology books on brain and behavior or social psychology that tells you, well, the psyche actually is the soul, and you're given the, the soul by God. Uh, no, there's no book that says, it. maybe history book that people used to think that, but uh, it's not in your contemporary scientific psychology books. So psychology is way beyond the theological stage, it's also beyond the abstract stage. Um, so there is no metaphysical principle involved there is no psyche that is, well, a kind of 
like a kind of life force or something like that, akin to a soul, but they're not made by God. Also not the case, even though many students and uh, psychologists still are dualists. So how that can be, uh, that, that uh, well, it's quite confusing to me uh, because that's not in your books. Psychology is actually in a scientific stage, but maybe not all psychologists doing psychology um, are already there. Um, and then you can ask things like what causes, and then you're looking for the mechanisms in the end, uh, for instance, an autism spectrum disorder. That, that is what you're trying to find out. How does, how, how does this work? How is this a genetic deficiency? Which de genetic deficiency are we talking about? And how does this work out in uh, the uh, development of a person? And if you know the answer to that question, you really have gained knowledge, or at least you have the possibility that you have gained real knowledge. We have all these problems of induction, etc. So we keep having those problems, of course. But it is relevant. It is relevant that you don't try to understand, that don't try to give pseudo explanations by referring to the soul. Oh, my soul is, well, I don't know. Uh, is damaged or something like that and then you have to go and well pray I don't know uh, you don't get therapies like that uh, you don't get theories of, about uh, that in your scientific psychology so the idea of Kant was that you could develop social sciences basically if you want to know about the social world if you want to make changes in the social world, if you want to have consensus about how to do that, use the method that enables scientists to do that in the natural sciences or in a natural world, apply it now to the social world, and then you get the social sciences. But you use the same method. And of course, that's not so strange that Kant came up with that idea and not with the idea, well, maybe we should have a different method because there was this method that was really successful, maybe we're not, we were not able to justify uh, the claims made by science. So empiricism, rationalism and the synthesis failed to do that, they failed to provide this judge, uh, justification for scientific claims, but still science was very successful, the natural sciences were very successful, and now you get the rise of the social sciences. And once you have that, you might think about the methods. Maybe social sciences need a method of their own. Kant argued that you should use the scientific method to solve social problems, and thereby he could be seen as someone who founded social sciences. Hermeneutics claims, and of course you can only claim it later, that the social sciences need a method of their own. Hermeneutics comes from hermeneutica, hermeneutica techne, the skill of interpretation of the old Greek. Initially, hermeneutics was the art of interpretation of the Greek mythology. So if you have a Greek myth like that of Icarus, then the question is, was this reality or is there is it just a story that has a hidden message? So if you say that the latter, there is a hidden message, then you say, well, what's the story about? And then maybe we can figure out what the hidden message is. So Icarus was on an island and he wanted to uh, go to the mainland and he had uh, he, he made um, wings of wax. But if that worked, then you should not fly too high because if you get close to the sun, the, max, the, the wax will uh, melt and then you fall into the sea. Now, what did Icarus do? You might guess. So he made wings out of wax and it worked and he flew to the mainland. That is, he flew in the direction of the mainland and then flew higher and higher and higher and higher because it was also good and it was also nice and he and came closer to the sun, the wax melted and he fell into the sea. Well, did it really happen? No, but there's a hidden message. You should not to be 
you should not be arrogant you should not try to be as the gods are you should not uh, commit hubris so because then you'll get punished right so don't be too arrogant to, don't try to be like the gods so that's the hidden message so that's the idea okay so you have these greek uh, myths uh, they're not depictions not stories about reality it's not history but it's fantasy with a moral and then you have to understand you have to interpret what's going on well, in the middle ages this this method became the method of, of interpreting the bible once you say that the bible is not a historical book but it's also just like greek mythology a book with a set of stories that have messages in them you have to try to decipher to interpret what the meaning is of these messages and then slowly this becomes a method of interpreting anything human beings have made and might be quite strange so if you have poetry or a painting you say well i, I don't know what was this about what's this poet poem about well then you try to find what the reasons were um, the poet wrote the poem and then you try to interpret what he said or she said and then you try to understand this poem and then in the 19th century those persons defending uh, hermeneutics claimed that it was a scientific method that was specific to the social sciences and it was different from the method that contrasts with that of the natural sciences. Why was a different method needed? Well, according to hermeneutics, people are more than just physical objects. We are beings that act in the world. So a rock doesn't act, only things happen to a rock. Human beings, all kinds of things happen to us well maybe that is something you can explain uh, with the method of the natural science but also we act in, in the world we do things and maybe you need to understand those things with uh, a method that's different from the method that merely explains uh, how things come about in a natural world Dildai, for instance said well people fall outside this natural order of cause and effect meaning that we there are not only causes influencing influencing us but we also have reasons to do things so we must not try to understand human beings just in terms of cause and effect we try to explain what happens to people we also should try to understand human beings in terms of what they do and why they do it and we don't need this natural method to understand why people do things so we can do science without that kind of laws and still you want uh, to have objective results of course you want science to be objective in the end you want to predict what people will do and then you get to this method of Verstehen and it's usually left in German uh, just like if, if we debating this hermeneutics then uh, we say well this new method is the method of Verstehen and the old method or the method that's being used by the natural science is the method of Erklären so Erklären is the method where you answer questions about how how things work you try to find out what the causes are what the effects are so you you have this mechanistic worldview and the social sciences they want to understand so to clear is to explain and to verstay and verstehen is to understand you want to understand why people are doing things you want to understand the reasons not the causes but the reasons and that means that you have to pay attention to the individual cases attention has to be paid to the subjective perspective why are you doing this and we'll see in a moment that that of course also is problematic 
Now, let's go back to this idea of interpreting a text of a Greek myth or the text of the Bible or a text of a poet. Then what you do is you read and you read the first sentence, then you read the first paragraph, then you read the first chapter, and then in the end you have read the book. And then you might say, okay, so maybe if I now go back to the first sentence, I might have a better understanding what this first sentence is about, what it means, how I should interpret that. So you have the sentence, which is part of a paragraph. I say, oh yeah, now I've read the entire book. Now I also understand this paragraph better. And, and even the, the very first chapter, the entire chapter, I understand better what the author meant because I've read the entire book now. So the idea is that this is called the hermeneutic circle. You read and you read and you read, you read the entire, uh, entire book. And then you go back to the beginning with a poet uh, that is very clear, the poet writes a poem, and uh, then you read the first line, you think, I don't know what this is about, and the second, then, and maybe it is only at the end that you, that you think, oh yeah, now now I, I get what is this is all about, and then you go back to the first line, you say, oh yeah, now it makes sense, now I, I understand, or now I have an interpretation of the meaning of this poem, and then you have found, found out the reasons why the poet wrote the poem. So that's the hermeneutic circle. You, you understand a part in the context of the whole, but you also get a better interpretation, a better understanding of the whole, of the entire poem in this case. And the same would go for understanding hu a human being. So you look at what a, a human being says or does, and you try to put that in the context of his or her entire life. And maybe the times in which they live, the society in which they live, understanding society. You need to understand the society or to understand the people living in it and what they are saying according to this method of verstehen, this hermeneutic method. So you also have a hermeneutic circle in the interpretation of the acts that are motivated by reasons of persons. And you try to understand human beings. So what does that mean for a psychologist? Well, according to these hermeneutics, psychologists are a social sciences that is in the business of understanding other people. So if human beings act in a peculiar way, then you might try to understand why they're doing that. And you're not trying to look for causes, but you're trying to look for reasons. Why is this person doing this? And then you ask the person and you try to uh, interpret what he or she is saying. So you, you're not looking for genetic causes or, or, or something like that. That would be the natural science, that would be the method of the natural science. And as you find the genetic causes, you still don't, you have an explanation, but you still don't have an understanding of the human being and why the human being does something. You're looking for reasons. So that means you should have a lot of courses in hermeneutics for psychology, for psychologists. My guess is you don't have any. So that means, and you have a lot, I think you have a lot of courses that uh, try to find the causes of uh, mental disorders. And maybe, maybe we can just classify all kinds of symptoms and say, well, then you put a label on it and uh, that's really convenient when you, talk with different people about this set of uh, symptoms or behaviors or uh, you can when you can label it you can ask money uh, back from the insurance when you have a therapy uh, for a client uh, that's all really convenient but in the end you want to know what causes a real mental disorder so 
social science, psychology, at this moment clearly is rather positivistic than hermeneutic. So why is that? What's the reason for that? And reasons, of course, if you are thinking from a positivist perspective, from the perspective that you use just one method in all sciences, and that this, this method is indeed trying to find out what the facts of the world are, and that the facts, just like David Hume says, we think about the facts in terms of cause and effect, that a reason is just a special cause. If you go back to the to the philosophy of mind course, then you'll say, okay, a reason is a cause, a reason is a mental state, and a mental state just is identical to a brain state, or at least it supervenes on it. An identity is one explanation, uh, realization is one explanation of this supervene or interpretation of uh, this supervenience relation. But a reason is just a mental cause, but that's still a cause. Thus, in this positivist way, you're still looking for causes, and, and when you know when you don't have these causes, well, you might use different methods, but in the end, your research is focused on finding out the facts, finding out the causes of human behavior. So, what's the reason that there is no, no, almost no, or maybe none of? Uh, uh, no, no course in hermeneutics for you? Well, it's not a science. It's not a scientific method. Here you see that, okay, if you, if you make a claim like that, many people would say it's not a science, it's not a scientific method. I think many people that are involved in making the program for psychologists do believe this because otherwise they would have put a lot of hermeneutics in it. So in next lecture, we'll move from epistemology to actual philosophy of science. And we're going to, we're going to think about what science is, what distinguishes it from pseudoscience or not science. And then you can answer this question, uh, at least for yourself, whether hermeneutics is science or not. So that doesn't mean, of course, that if, if you classify hermeneutics as not a scientific discipline or method or endeavor or human behavior or whatever, just like doing the dishes is not science or a scientific method, it might still be important. It might still be important um, to use uh, in, uh, in, in everyday life or in, the, in making decisions, but it's not a scientific method to discover facts. So that's what we will do in next lecture. Then we'll see that we say, well, where do we get knowledge from? Well, from science. Where do we get knowledge about the facts? From science. Where do we get knowledge from the causes and effects? From science. And then you see that uh, in the end, if we that understand what science is, that hermeneutics is not a science, or at least the people that claim that hermeneutics is not a science might have a good case arguing for that claim. Well, there is some criticism also from contemporary hermeneutics like Habermas and Gadamer. Uh, they point out that if you interpret someone else, you can only do that from your own background. So I know things about the world, about the social world. I know why I do things. I know why some people closely related to me uh, in my, in my, in my uh, group of friends, why they do things because they've told me so. And then you try to interpret strangers. And then, of course, you use that knowledge of why people do things. But that means that that is really subjective from your own perspective because you only have your own subjective background to interpret the behavior or the actions if you want if you like if there if you think that there are actions that actions exist um then uh, you try to interpret them from your own subjective perspective and if you want to have 
objective science, then clearly this is going to be a problem because you can't get rid of your own subjective background if you think about reasons. A second point of critique comes from the neo-positivists, from the logical positivists. We'll look at them in the next lecture, but here we have already some uh, criticism of them to this uh, idea of uh, hermeneutics as a science. They wanted an objective science. You'll see that they want to have behaviorism in psychology, for instance. So you don't say anything about subjective inner mental states. So you're not in that business as a psychologist. You're a behaviorist and you're not looking at subjective reasons for doing things. You're looking at dispositions and they can be observed and you can have uh, you can make you, you can discover regularities in the behavior in, in the in the relation between input and output stimulus and response so you're not doing that and of course if you would do that then there are all kinds of alternative interpretations possible of what possible reasons humans might have for doing something so that also diverges from uh, an objective science. And the last one really is important, comes from Hempel, also a logical positivist. We'll look at logical positivism does, uh, uh, in the next lecture. How do we interpret others? Well, if it really is the case that you can only interpret others from your own subjective point of view, that you really can understand only other human beings when they are like you, then how are you going to be a good psychologist if you have persons with all kinds of mental disorders, you want to help them, but you just let's assume that you didn't have all these mental disorders yourself. I think that's a fairly uh, plausible assumption. You might have one, two, but not all of them. So how are you going to help people? How, how are you going to understand those people that have a disorder you're not familiar with from your own subjective point of view if you need that subjective point of view to understand those people? It's not going to work. Still, you're doing psychology without the hermeneutics. There are loads of people that are being held by psychologists, by clinical psychologists, that do that never have experienced anything like it. Uh, still, they are these, these psychologists are able to help these people. That would be impossible if hermeneutics would be, if this Verstehen method would be uh, key to psychology, would be key to uh, uh, a treatment, to, to a therapy. Ample says clearly that's not the case. So there really are big problems with Verstehen as a scientific method. Right, we've seen a lot of this lecture, so let's briefly summarize it and see what we have to do next. When we're thinking about knowledge we want to know what the source of knowledge is and basically what we want to answer is how can we justify our beliefs because knowledge is justified and true belief well we have beliefs mental states that are about something they might be true they might correspond to facts but you might have beliefs that are true by accident you might you might be wrong about something you actually don't know you might say well or, or write about something you don't know so you, you might think that there's life on another planet in our solar system or in the universe and you might be wrong about that you might be right about that but you basically don't know so you can't have knowledge about it because in order to have knowledge you have a justification and we have seen that in contemporary in in, in uh, modern uh, philosophy Cartesian ra rationalism the British uh, empiricist and also Immanuel uh, Kant, they all have their problems. They all fail, basically, to provide a justification for our beliefs. But science was still very successful 
And then that suggests that if science, being the natural science in, in those days, if science is really successful in solving problems with respect to the natural world, then it might also be a good method to solve problems in the social world. And then we have seen that Comte defends his uh, positivism. And once he does that, you can have the rise of social sciences like sociology, and then human ethics came, came along, comes along and says, well, maybe the social sciences need a method that focuses on reasons for people to act instead of causes for things to happen, which is the domain of the natural sciences. Yeah, so like uh, physics and biology. Uh, but there we have seen that to be a proper scientific uh, method, it is way too subjective. You want to have general laws. Uh, you want to be able to say something about uh, people having mental disorders without needing to have had that mental disorder yourself. Because then it would re really become problematic to become a psychologist for instance. So that seems to be too subjective. This is a course in philosophy of science that has a historical overview. So next time we'll take a look at the next step in history, in history of thinking about knowledge and science. And it is in next lecture that we indeed turn to philosophy of science. We've been doing epistemology so far. Of course, we have mentioned science every now and then, but next lecture, when we'll discuss logical positivism, we'll see that there is this change from epistemology to philosophy of science. Then philosophy of science becomes a separate discipline in philosophy. Next time, thus, we look at logical positivism. They try to answer the question what is science? What's the hallmark of science? And they do that because they believe in a form of, they, they defend a form of positivism and they claim that science is the source of knowledge. So there you see that if you answer the question, what's the source of knowledge by saying science, then you need to think about what science is. You have this new question, you don't ask what's the source of knowledge, you have an answer to that, it's science, but then you have the new question, what is science? And that is basically if you think critically about that, philosophy of science, and we're going to do that in the next lectures. What sort of question can you expect on the exam about today's content of this lecture? You could expect a question about Kant, about the different stages he recognizes. So what, according to Kant, are the stages in the development of every domain of knowledge? First, the abstract stage. Well, that's incorrect. We start with the theological stage. So answer A is incorrect. B, first, the theological stage. That's correct. Then the metaphysical stage. Indeed, that's the second one. And finally, the positive stage or the scientific stage. So B is correct. And then C and D should be incorrect. Well, first the positive stage, well, that's the stage we end with. And first the metaph metaphysical stage in D, that's the one in the middle. Uh, so uh, indeed, B is the only correct answer here. Easy question, I think. That's it for lecture three. Stay safe.